Early voting for the April 2nd spring general election begins tomorrow. And one of the citywide races on the ballot is city attorney. The city attorney's office acts as in-house counsel for the city, representing the city in litigation. Two candidates are running for city attorney this election cycle, incumbent Tierman Spencer and state representative Evan Goyke. Lake Effect Sam Woods reached out to both candidates for an unedited interview, though only Goyke responded to this request. When a candidate does not agree or respond to requests for an interview ahead of an election, we run what we call a non-interview to try to outline their positions for listeners based on previous public statements. You'll hear a non-interview with Spencer following this interview with Evan Goyke. City attorney is one of those elected positions that I'm not sure it is common knowledge what the office does or even that it exists as an elected position, right? So we'll start with the basics. What does a city attorney do and why are you seeking the job? Uh, Well, the city attorney's office is a full-scale law firm for the city as an entity. So we um, represent the city and provide legal advice uh, to city actors in almost every capacity. Residents, um, unfortunately, most commonly interact with the city attorney's office in municipal court. We staff as prosecutors and the uh, municipal courts downtown. Um, And that's not the district attorney's office, but the the, uh, municipal court. So speeding tickets, things like that. Uh, And then, you know, we represent the city when uh, sued. And that could be a car accident or a slip and fall or a civil rights violation. We provide... Uh, legal counsel to the various departments at city government, the city council, the mayor, um, real estate transactions that involve city financing, city land. And so really, uh, as I'm describing this on the on the campaign trail, it really does touch just about every operation of city government, um, some really big yeah. and public and prominent and some that you probably will never encounter as a resident. But it's a real critical part of um, city operations. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned litigation. Central um, litigation and defending the city against litigation is central to the role of city attorney. Um, and that litigation ex- experience is you know, important to doing, doing the job well. Um, and I know you graduated from Marquette Law School in 2009 and worked as a public defender um, until being elected to the state assembly in 2012, where you serve now. Um, what, but what would you say to someone who looks at those kind of two and a half years of um, practicing the law as, as, a, as, as a, in litigation and wondering whether you're the right person to lead the legal representation of about 600,000 Milwaukeeans? Sure. Well, I've never really stopped using my legal education. You don't, and I think most lawyers would admit this, that you never really forget what you've learned or turn your, your brain off. And having worked in the state legislature for the last 11 years, I've worked very closely with the city council, the mayor, actually with the city attorney's office on crafting legislation. And and you use your legal education. I've used my legal education in doing that and in in both writing the law, writing it in a way that it will be interpreted to the best uh, interest of the city so that we're solving the problem that we're seeking to solve. Um, You know, I look forward to – I went to law school for a reason. I love politics. Mm -hmm. I've loved serving in the legislature, but I cannot wait to get back into court. Um, I cut my teeth as a lawyer in court. I'm not afraid of getting up and talking to juries. Um, I I look forward to staffing municipal court. Um, So, you know, for the listeners uh, once elected, you know, I want to take a shift in municipal court. I want to walk the walk with all of the assistant uh, lawyers in the office, and I I cannot wait to get back into court. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Um, in the past, you've talked about as a state representative working with the city attorney's office. And um, you, you said at one point that you fell in love with the mission of the city inter- city attorney's office. Um, so can you talk about how the city attorney works with other legal bodies, such as the state legislature, um, to enact and uphold the law? Sure. Well, the, the example that I was referencing involved uh, working with the city attorney's office, this was in 2015 or 2016, um, to combat a nuisance property uh, in my neighborhood on 27th and Kilbourne. It was a magnet for criminal activity, and neighbors really organized to try to 
clean up the corner mm-hmm. and, and, and make the neighborhood safer. And the city attorneys, when I say I fell in love with it, I watched the assistant city attorneys. They were working with us residents to try to solve our problem and, and tried to do that in court and found that there were some loopholes in state law that prevented them from holding this property owner accountable the way a different business owner would be able to be held accountable. And so we worked together in Madison. So it, uh, And we crafted a, a new law. We wrote it and passed it and enacted it, uh, and and actually fixed the problem. And I really loved that because it was creative. It was you know we we used the tools. The the city attorney's office was using the tools they had in court. Found them to be insufficient to solve the problem that neighbors were bringing, and then you know kind of pivoted. Um, so the city attorney's office interacts with. A whole host of different entities. I've mentioned, you know, providing counsel to the to the mayor, to the city council, to the various uh, boards and commissions and departments in city uh, in city government. And so it really is uh, the redevelopment authority, the housing authority, MPS um, school board. The the we our lawyers work in in really creative and new ways. It's it's hard to tell you exactly what 2024 and 2025 and 2026 will bring. Just know that if these new novel issues come up, the city attorney will be in the background helping provide counsel, helping guide, helping litigate, helping defend uh, to address the problems as they may arise. Yeah. Well, on that um, note of looking towards the future and not knowing exactly what's going to come up, but um, from your view as a candidate for the city to be city attorney, what should the city attorney's office be doing uh, now that it is not doing? Well, I think really... My focus will be on public safety and 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 solutions to public safety are many. And so you have to have a multifaceted approach. But the the first and most direct response for public safety to me as city attorney will be the enforcement of traffic offenses in municipal court. I think we need to be uh, real about the the you know, just admit the realities of the unsafe conditions on many streets, and there are too many people that have had, you know, repeated citations that continue to drive. Um, I think over the weekend we had another traffic fatality. I fully support the mayor's Vision Zero, which is to get to a zero traffic fatalities in Milwaukee and municipal court. And the enforcement of existing traffic laws is a, an important role there. But I also look at safety as a broader, you know, neighborhood-based. What 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 makes a safe place? And and I used the example earlier of of the corner that was a magnet of criminal activity. That wasn't a traditional kind of law enforcement response, mm-hmm. but in in holding that business accountable, we've seen crime go down in my neighborhood on the near west side by double digits. And so I'm really excited to work on the neighborhood level. Um, we have beautiful, diverse mosaic of neighborhoods in Milwaukee. It's one of the really you know unique, beautiful things about mm-hmm. this city. And each of those neighborhoods has unique challenges and unique solutions. Some neighbors on the north side may have a different Uh, public safety concern than neighborhoods on the east side or south side. And I'm excited to listen to neighbors and help work with them directly. Um, A a component that I I really want to address is housing and housing quality. I believe housing quality is, is a key to neighborhood safety. We have huge portions of our city that pay 30, 40, 50 percent of their earnings to uh, live in unsuitable conditions. The previous city attorney, uh, Grant Langley, and his administration took a, a novel approach using an existing law called receivership and took two notorious slumlords to court, took the properties away from those landlords that, that were, you know, they were profiting on uninhabitable conditions. And we, 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 Ran them out of business and and flipped those properties and and into better, more responsible hands. We need to bring back accountability to property owners. People are paying good money, uh, and 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 I think if 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 we have if we're if we're realistic and and, and honest about the conditions in the neighborhood, and we say we're going to start with quality housing, stable, affordable, quality housing, you can build off of that in any neighborhood, in any part of the city. It's a need that is universal. It's nonpartisan. Um, I don't want to. I'm not villainizing landlords. It's a it's a difficult career, but uh, we need to hold them accountable. People are paying good money. We need to make sure. If, you know, if it was a restaurant, you would walk in and you would see 
the health department's letter A yeah. or B or C. Right. And, and so we need to bring that type of transparency and demand excellence and, and, and quality from our, from our landlords because people are paying for it. Yeah. My last question, we'll get to uh, the get back at, to the relationship between the city attorney's office and the state legislature. And it's about shared revenue and lawsuits. So the city of Milwaukee and the Wisconsin state legislature have a bit of an adversarial relationship sometimes uh, when it comes to budgets and the and the law. Um, for context, we saw uh, this last summer when the state passed Act 12, which uh, tied Milwaukee's legal right to raise its own taxes and receive um, a share of the shared revenue from this of the budget surplus from the um, from the state to a list of policy conditions including mandatory hiring of police and the presence of law enforcement on the fire and police commission which is the city's uh, civilian police oversight board um, as well as other conditions that only applied to Milwaukee um, I bring this up because when act 12 went into effect last summer there was some talk in the city that the that the city might sue the state over these provisions, saying that it interferes with Milwaukee's right to state, uh, excuse me, right to self-govern. Um, however, that lawsuit never materialized. Um, so my question to you is: If a similar situation occurred during your term, what would be your approach uh, to working with the state legislature as the chief legal advocate of Milwaukee? Well, I, obviously, I know that. Uh landscape well yeah. and was and had worked on shared revenue and a local option sales tax for years and we you know I was in the room with the Republicans when those provisions were added to the bill and ultimately I voted against the bill because of those strings that were attached I could mm -hmm. find no other example in any major metro city in America where that same provision those same yeah. strings were attached and so ultimately I voted no I think it's important that I um, clarify the city attorney doesn't wake up and decide what policy initiatives she or he wants to endeavor in. We are the counsel, uh, legal counsel to our client, the city. So really following the lead of the city council, our client and the mayor, our client and, and what their uh, hopes are and what their legislative agenda is. I, I don't set that for them. I just mm -hmm. help guide it. I want to stay connected and engaged because so many facets, facets of municipal operations are governed by state law. It's mm -hmm. important that we have a strong relationship in Madison. Um, I, I, I am excited to walk arm in arm with uh, the mayor and the city council members um, in, in continuing to push for good policy in Madison. Um, my greatest successes in Madison and working across the aisle have uh, been built off of bringing majority party members to Milwaukee. So to, 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 uh, to answer you, I, I want to I bring Madison to Milwaukee more. I want them to see us and to experience uh, life. And, and I, don't, I don't mean just downtown for mm -hmm. an event at night. I mean in the neighborhoods and really experience the diversity. And that has been powerful because the majority of legislators in Wisconsin come from communities that are drastically different than the city of Milwaukee. We are unique in this state. And so we, I, 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 my greatest successes have been from a place of education, and I look forward to continuing to do that, opening our doors, opening our books. We run a good government. We, city government is well run. Let's let's tell our story and bring bring anyone that, that, that wants to to town to, to experience all the benefits of our great community. All right. Well, Evan, thank you again uh, so much for joining me on Lake Effect, and I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Evan Goyke is a state representative running for city attorney. He spoke with Lake Effect Sam Woods. How do you do an interview without the person you're supposed to be interviewing? At WUWM, we believe that politicians should exist to serve you. When they're running for office, it is part of our mission to ask them questions that you want answered and share what they believe regarding those questions that you care about. So when a candidate does not agree or respond to requests for an interview ahead of an election, we run what we call a non-interview to try to outline their positions for listeners. Tierman Spencer is running for re-election to be Milwaukee City Attorney, running against State Representative Evan Goyke. Representative Goyke did agree to an unedited interview, which you just heard. However, after weeks of emails and phone calls, Spencer did not answer my request for an unedited interview about his term as City Attorney and what he plans to do in the future, should he be re-elected. So instead, 
we want to provide you with Spencer's stances as we understand them, and with some of the questions we were hoping to ask him. My first question for Spencer would have been about his tumultuous first term as city attorney and why voters should trust him to right the ship in his second term. I'll provide some context for this question. In 2020, Tierman Spencer won his election against Grant Langley, who was Milwaukee city attorney for 36 years. Spencer focused his campaign on Langley's reputation for not settling police misconduct cases, instead choosing to take them to jury trials and, in the process, racking up legal bills for the city. In his first year, Spencer took two high-profile actions that seemed to set the tone for how his city attorney's office would act differently from Langley's. During the summer of 2020, Spencer announced that he would not prosecute all of the tickets issued by the Milwaukee Police Department to protesters who allegedly violated curfew in the nights immediately following George Floyd's murder. Instead, Spencer decided to prosecute on a case-by-case basis. Additionally, he also recommended a $750,000 settlement in the case of former Milwaukee Bucks player Sterling Brown, who was tased and arrested over a parking violation in 2018. But not everything about that first year went according to plan. Within the first few months of Spencer's term, members of his office left in droves, and his office has continued to be understaffed throughout his term to this day. He blamed the departures on low staff pay, unfair media coverage, changes in workplace dynamic due to COVID, and staff hired by his predecessor resisting change. Here he is at a press conference in October 2021 explaining the departures. A lot of the issues that we hear and we're talking about are issues that I inherited. I have quite a few people leaving, quite a few people leaving for salary reasons, and others change. People just don't like change. But I want you to know when I ran I won the election, and you know the numbers. That was reflective of the change that the people wanted. And you also see how I've been received from day one getting here. So put two and two together, we understand exactly what's going on. However, as his term as city attorney continued, problems continued to mount. In 2022, A former staffer, Naomi Galing, filed a sexual discrimination claim against Spencer, alleging that he touched her inappropriately. In addition, Spencer instructed another attorney working in Spencer's office to write a memo denigrating Galing's work after she requested to leave Spencer's office, citing a, quote, toxic and uncomfortable workplace, end quote. The attorney who Spencer requested to write this memo resigned, calling the request a, quote, abuse of power. Spencer maintained that the allegations were not accurate. However, the Common Council recommended settling Galing's case for $40,000. State investigators later found probable cause that Spencer violated state labor law by forcing Galing out of his office because of her allegations against him. And Spencer has not made a habit of speaking with the media during his term. At the same press conference in October 2021, he said that this is because the media twists his words. And I want to ask you guys right now, Stop harassing my employees. You know, with your direct, vindictive questioning, don't do it. If you have questions for my staff, come through the office. Come through me. And if you want a statement, I'll give it to you. But as I told you before, I'm no longer giving you interviews because you do not report them accurately. I will give you a statement if you report it as written, without your changes, because you are not reporting what is being accurately said. And that's very unfortunate. Now, had I had the chance to interview Spencer, I would have asked him if he still believes now, as he did in 2021, that low staff pay, media coverage, and issues inherited from his predecessor are still to blame for turmoil in his office. Or if Spencer now accepts any amount of personal responsibility for this turmoil. I would have also asked Spencer why voters should trust him to right the ship in his second term. My next question for Spencer is about what issues he believes his office can address if he is elected to another term. First, I will provide some context for this question. In spite of internal turmoil, Spencer's office has also seen some bona fide wins during his tenure. In 2020, Spencer recommended that Milwaukee join the state of Wisconsin and over 5,000 other states and cities in a class action lawsuit against Juul Labs, an e-cigarette manufacturer. The lawsuit accused Jewel of knowingly targeting minors in his advertising campaigns. In 2023, it was announced that Milwaukee would receive $2.47 million in the settlement, which it plans to spend on campaigns to mitigate tobacco use by minors. 
And this can be seen as delivering on a campaign promise. In his 2020 campaign, Spencer said that he wanted the city attorney's office to be, quote, more proactive and that, quote, we should be preventing problems, not just avoiding responsibility, end quote. If I had the chance to interview Spencer, I would have asked him if using his office to, quote, prevent problems like e-cigarette use by minors would still be a central focus in his office if he wins second term. And if so, what are some issues that he thinks the city attorney's office is well positioned to address? My last question for Spencer would have been about his office's ability to sue the state over policy positions enforced by Act 12, a budget bill passed by the state legislature last summer. And I'll give some context for this question as well. As part of Act 12, the Wisconsin state legislature granted Milwaukee the right to raise local taxes and a higher share of the state's shared revenue. On the condition that the city government accepts certain policy conditions, which included the mandatory hiring of police officers and the presence of law enforcement on the Fire and Police Commission, the city's civilian police oversight board. Now, I bring this up because at the time, there was talk at the Common Council that the city might sue the state over these conditions, alleging that they were an unprecedented attack on the city's right to self-govern, and that these kinds of conditions have never been enforced on any other city in the country. However, that lawsuit never materialized. Had I had the chance to interview Spencer, I would have asked why this lawsuit was not pursued. Are there legal reasons the city could not sue the state over this? Or was there another strategy behind not pursuing the lawsuit? At WUWM.com, you can find WUWM's elections mission statement, as well as information about how we decide which candidates we ask for interviews ahead of elections, and our policy on candidate outreach. There, you'll also find our interview with Spencer's opponent, State Representative Evan Goyke. The election is on April 2nd. In Milwaukee, early voting starts tomorrow. And you can have a say in our 2024 election coverage by filling out our election survey. You can find a link at wuwm.com. What you tell us will help inform the stories you hear on Lake Effect and WUWM. 